Hello, folks. I'm pleased to welcome you. Uh, please don't feel like you have to stop eating, but we're going to start the program. I see a lot of familiar faces. I'm grateful to you all for coming out. And for folks uh, for whom this is new, uh, I'm David Corey. I'm the director of Baylor in Washington, DC. And our event today is on social trust. I'd like to thank um, my team for helping to put this together, Molly Moore, Nate Mills, and Matthew Lee Anderson. And I'd also like to thank the University of Dallas, who has come alongside and co-sponsored this event. Tom Hibbs, who's the president of the University of Dallas, was the director of Baylor in DC before me. Um, I thought I'd be just begin by briefly attempting to define social trust. It's not actually an easy thing to define, and social scientists have struggled with the best ways to define it and to measure it. But in general, what we're talking about here today is the extent to which citizens feel they can trust social institutions and each other. So we're talking about trust in government, trust in businesses and NGOs, trust in media, in religious institutions and family ties, and in the individuals with whom we come into contact. And trust is so important because it's a precondition of what we call social capital, which is the invisible well of resources that we accrue by virtue simply of knowing people, people who can help us in myriad unpredictable ways. In government, trust is a precondition of sound deliberation and policy formation. In business, it's key to effective problem solving and innovation. Trust in the media is key to a well-informed electorate. And trust in our churches, families, and friends is indispensable for individual well-being and human flourishing. So it's alarming to hear that the problem of social trust is that it is rapidly collapsing around us and has been gradually over decades, but precipitously over the past five to 10 years. Now, you might be thinking that Americans have always been di distrustful of government, and that's true. That's in our political DNA. That's not something new. But compared to 1958, when 73% of Americans basically trusted government to do what was right, 73%, that number in 2019 is 17%. Trust in religious institutions, 68% in 1975, 36% today. Fewer than one in four Americans have confidence in the criminal justice system. That's 24% of Americans have confidence in our criminal justice system. Newspapers, 28%. Big business, 23%. And the most distrusted institution in all of American culture, Congress, 11%. 11% trust in the Congress. Only 52% of Americans have some or a little confidence in Congress. So the question with which we must wrestle is what is causing this rapid decline in social trust? I've said that it matters because it's a precondition of capital and innovation and information and citizenship. But what's causing the collapse is very hard to say. We do notice that low levels of trust correlate with certain other demographic traits, and I'll list them briefly. Low income correlates with low, with low social trust. Divorce, low education levels, relative youth. It turns out young people are less trustful than people who are older. Minority status correlates with distrust. So we get a picture that the, the problem of trust may relate to some feelings of insecurity and vulnerability in our society. There are a few things that correlate with trust. Church attendance correlates with trust. But remember the problem that trust in churches is declining rapidly. Hmm. Life outside of cities correlates with social trust. Something bad about cities. Democrats and Republicans are equally concerned about social trust. There's not a remarkable difference between the parties. 
And I think these kind of demographic considerations may help shed some light on the causes of the collapse, but really not much light. Even less do they tell us what might be done to reverse these trends. And this isn't just an abstract idea. Uh, Elizabeth Corey, my wife who will be moderating, and I have experienced in our lives living in Waco, Texas, around Baylor University, people come into our lives who fit some of these demographics of low income and low social trust. And we've been uh, endeavoring to help various people and we've seen their lives fall apart. Maybe you've seen this too. I suspect with the kind of numbers I'm talking about, people in this room have known people who lack the kind of basic social capital that enables them to, to thrive. And it's very sad to see, and the problem is increasing. So I'd, I'd like to introduce this panel. I'm not gonna go into the, the biographies, but I would invite you to look uh, into your program, which you should have, and you'll see a biography of each of our speakers. You, I suspect you already know them anyway. Um, uh, Bill Gostin, whose work on social trust has been so important uh, at the Brookings Institute, Naomi Schaefer Riley from AEI, who has written on the subject, Robbie P. George, in whose initiative this event is taking place. We've um, been um, enjoying this long-running initiative with Robbie George uh, at, the, at the intersection of, of faith and public life, and we've been very pleased to work with him, and he's done such great things on these panels, bringing together uh, our speakers and leading intellectually. So thank you, Robbie, for that. And then Elizabeth Corey, who's at Baylor University, she directs the Honors College. Um, people say uh, all the time um, that um, I'm her husband. I, so I, I, I'm the one who needs the introduction, but here I'm introducing Elizabeth Corey. Anyway, please welcome our panel. Well, thank you, David, for, for that nice introduction. I, I think what we will do today is more or less progress in a kind of a set of questions that will begin with a diagnosis, maybe turn then to uh, what might be a remedy for the problem of declining social trust. And then I want to focus especially, uh, since this is a Baylor-sponsored event, on the, the question of uh, religious institutions and the way they may help or perhaps not help the, the problem of social trust. So I thought we would begin uh, by asking a question about, uh, just that, that will imply a kind of description of the problem. So. How bad, and this is not directed to anyone in particular, but I'd love to hear from any or all of the panelists, how bad is the decline in social trust? And what do we understand the causes of this decline to be? Uh, allied with that, who is less trusting than others and why? And why is this such a pressing problem for our polity? That's actually four questions at once. <laughs> but if any of those interest you, please feel free to take them up. Why, why do we find ourselves here? Well, Elizabeth, let me, uh, let me begin, and I, uh, before addressing the question, which I'll, I'll be happy to do, uh, let me thank uh, David uh, and Elizabeth uh, and the team at, at Baylor. Uh, it's wonderful to be working with them on a regular basis as part of the initiative we have in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, special thanks to my two good friends, uh, Bill Galston and Naomi Schaefer Riley, for joining us uh, for this. Uh, for this panel when we were thinking about the importance of the problem of social trust and the, uh, the need to have a forum like this. These were two names that immediately uh, jumped to mind and I'm just so delighted that they were available and able to uh, work it out. So thanks uh, for that very much, guys. And thanks to all of you uh, for coming out, especially those of you who are regular attendees at our events. And I hope that those of you who aren't will uh, like this one well enough to, to, to keep coming back. We, we, we have more things planned. Uh, for you on important themes like the decline of social trust. Well, Elizabeth, the first thing I would say in substance in answer to your question uh, when it comes to the diagnosis, uh, and I say this with absolutely no pleasure, uh, is that much of the decline in social trust is merited. <laughs> Why do people not trust institutions? Because so many of our institutions have shown that they are not worthy of people's trust. Congress at 11%, I think I can account for that. <laughs> uh, the executive branch, they may poll a little higher, but whether they are Republicans or Democrats, uh, there have been a lot of reasons for people not to trust things that they say, things that they do. Uh, and then beyond, even the courts, and beyond politics, uh, religious institutions is one of the things that, uh, that uh, David rightly mentioned, where we have a decline of of trust. I myself am a Catholic, an Orthodox Catholic. Uh, people like me trusted our bishops. 
We trusted them. We trusted them to do the right thing. And you can imagine how we feel at the revelations of so many wrong things that were done, not just the abuse uh, itself, but the cover-ups, uh, the failure to deal adequately uh, with the uh, problems, uh, people protecting their own reputations or foolishly trying to defend the, protect the church's uh, reputation by doing uh, the wrong thing. Uh, and I'll bet some of you are not Catholics, and uh, I'll bet you have similar stories to tell about your own religious institutions. We've seen it in various of the Protestant traditions, in the Jewish uh, traditions, um, in the Muslim tradition. Um, these are merited uh, declines in, in trust. And I hope and pray that these institutions, governmental and non-governmental, will do something, will take the message, will get the message that trust needs to be rebuilt, and to rebuild it, you have to earn it. You're not gonna be able to trick people into trusting you. Not anymore, if you could ever do that. You can't trick people into trusting you. It's not gonna happen. You have to merit the trust by showing that you are trustworthy, and that means doing the right thing for the right reason in a timely manner. That means being willing to pay a cost or at least take a risk, say a political cost, a political risk for doing the right thing. And of course we could go on well beyond uh, uh, religion into business. Uh, the professions, the professions have done a lot to merit this decline in, in trust. Medical, my own profession, the legal profession, the academy, where I spend most of my time, We've got a lot to answer for. There's a reason people don't trust the professoriate all that much or the institutions of colleges and universities or schools all that much. Unions, I grew up in West Virginia, grandson of coal miners, immigrant coal miners. And I'm not that old and I can still remember a time when we trusted the union, the United Mine Workers of America. When, when I was growing up, I remember visiting my paternal grandmother and grandfather's house on many occasions, and there were three portraits up. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Jesus Christ. And John L. Lewis. John L. Lewis. There we go. Exactly <laughs> right, Bill, Bill got it in, in no time. Now we loathed the companies, and alas, we were right to loathe the company. There was a lot of merited distrust there, the coal companies, but we trusted the union. And by the time uh, I was 12 or 13 years old, Bill, you'll remember the, the um, assassination of Jock Yablonski by oh, yes. Tony Boyle. We learned about the corruption, the deep corruption of the union. The union bosses were no better than the companies. So we've got to rebuild this. Our institutions have to rebuild it and by doing the right thing for the right reason and taking some risks, being willing to take some risks, being willing to to pay, some, uh, uh, to pay some costs. So with that, I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists. Um, so I, I, I had a similar thought, uh, which is you know, how much of this trust, uh, this, this loss of social trust is merited. Um, and I thought about you know, what, it, what it was that these institutions um, were promising us, because that also seems to be part of it. It's not just, you know, do you trust this institution in a vacuum? It's, you know, what has Congress or journalism or, you know, the, the lawyers or doctors, you know, promised you and how have they failed to deliver? Um, and part of me thinks this is a little bit of a problem of over-promising. Hmm. I mean, if you are comparing, you know, what you expected Congress to do in your life 50 or 60 years ago and what you expect them to do now, I think that the expectations have risen and a lot of these institutions have failed to meet them. Um, I think you know the Academy has promised to remake society in a lot of ways. They have promised to solve all sorts of social problems and they've gotten away from some of their core mission. But people look at what the promises uh, are that have been made and when uh, those institutions fail to deliver on them, uh, then, the, then the trust is gone. And I, you know, again, that too is understandable. Um, in thinking about this question, I've actually spent a lot of time recently writing about um, child welfare and foster care. Um, and uh, that is an, an area where you've seen a, a complete 
um, kind of social breakdown. You've seen the initial family breakdown, um, but then all the institutions that were supposed to take care of these children um, have also uh, fallen down on the job in many ways. And there, um, you know, and, and families that used to say, you know, we need help, uh, you know, something is going horribly wrong, um, now, you know, uh, are not trusting enough of others in their community to ask for that help. Um, and I think maybe that's what David was talking about a little bit earlier when he said, you know, we see people who are who are truly in need, and the loss of social trust has actually hastened, uh, you know, their decline and and the problems that they've had. Um, so, you know, I've seen that, you know, on a, on a very visceral level uh, in terms of the who is, uh, you know, who, who these foster kids are and, and the lack of, of placements for them. But I also had this other um, revelation recently which suggested to me that the social trust, um, although it, the loss of social trust, although it may be correlated with um, a lower level of income is actually uh, certainly a problem throughout society and, and across uh, an, an economic and educational spectrum. Um, I visited recently a, a program in Colorado called Project 127, um, and they try to train uh, foster families, and they require foster families to actually sign up uh, five other people in the community who promise to help them in their journey as they are fostering, who will you know, help them materially if they need you know, to build furniture or who help them you know, by praying for them or picking up the kid after school or all of these things that um, will kind of upend your life if you decide to engage in foster care. And a lot of these people I talked to found it very hard to come up with five other people in their community that they would want to place this burden on. So here were these people, I mean, they're generally middle class, educated, often have children of their own, are financially stable, um, often even living in a strong church community themselves. And even they um, find that their social circles have contracted to such an extent that um, they, don't, they don't know who they should call upon, you know, not just in case of emergency, but just kind of in terms of day-to-day -day help. And these are people who are taking on a tremendous burden themselves. So it's not like if they called someone, the person would say, you know, why are you bothering me with this? This is amazing stuff that you're doing. Um, and then even in just talking to my own kind of friends about this after I came back, people told me that they weren't sure who to put down as the emergency contact on their kid's school form. Not because they didn't have friends in the community and not because they didn't think that, you know, their next door neighbor would go pick up the kid in case of emergency, but because we all are, I think, um, the expectation is we live very self-sufficient lives, certainly within our nuclear family, um, that if we cannot do it ourselves, um, we often pay someone to do it, um, rather than asking this of other people in our community. And so I would just say that even at the kind of upper echelons of society, what I find is that um, these connections are weaker, they're fraying, and people feel very worried about imposing um, on others and even embarrassed that they are not um, kind of totally self-sufficient uh, units or, or individual beings. <coughs> well, I'm gonna start out uh, on, a, on a more pedantic note. Uh, uh, by distinguishing between two related but quite distinct dimensions of the problem of trust. The first has to do with trust in institutions. The other has to do with trust in one another. Those are two very different objects of trust and they've had different histories over the past 50 or 60 years. Uh, institutional trust, uh, as late as the mid-1960s, about 75% of Americans trusted the federal government to do the right thing all or most of the time. 10 years later, in the mid-1970s, that number had been cut to 25%. We were a high institutional trust society for the 20 years after the Second World War. Then we made a 10-year transition to a low trust society 
And we have been a low institutional trust society ever since. It's gone up and down, but we shifted from one mode to another mode, and we have found it impossible to shift back. And if you ask what happened in those 10 years to crater trust in government, uh, the answer is obvious, right? We had a series of upheavals. Uh, we had, you know, we had the Vietnam War. Uh, we had, uh, you know, the, the cultural revolution of our own. We had Watergate. Uh, we had the sight of one of the world's oldest and most distinguished political parties ripping itself to shreds on national television, et cetera. It was a tumultuous 10 years at the end of which we were not the same country that we were when we began. Uh, and uh, if you ask, if, if, and as previous panelists have indicated, trust in all other major institutions with just two exceptions, the military and small business, has plunged in roughly the same ways, though not at exactly the same time. What's going on? Well, think about trust in institutions for a minute. It has two dimensions. First of all, you have to believe in the motives, the good intentions, the character of the people who inhabit and run these institutions. But secondly, you have to believe in competence, right? It doesn't help very much if your doctor really wants to cure you, but doesn't know how. So you need both good intentions and competence. Nobody sets, nobody sets out to lose a war, right? Nobody, you know, no general, nobody in the military hierarchy sets out to lose a war, right? You can trust their intentions, but for one reason or another, if they're not as competent as the situation requires, misjudgment will be piled on misjudgment, and the consequence is defeat. And I'd say, in, with regard to institutions, you know, our trust in both the character and the competence of people leading them has undergone a serious decline. But it's not a recent decline. That's the point I want to make. It's not, there hasn't been an abrupt plunge recently. Uh, now let's talk about the other dimension for just a minute. You know, trust in one another. You know, and here there is a question that has been asked for half a century that is the standard question. Generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted or that you can't be too careful in dealing with people. About 50 years ago, equal numbers of people gave the same answer to one, each part of that question. We were 50-50, 50% 50 trusters, 50% non-trusters in dealing with other people. Today, it's about two to one in favor of the non-trusters. But it hasn't been the kind of plunge that we saw between 1965 and 1975 for institutions. It has been like a slow leak in a tire, a point or two every couple of years, taking us from 50% trust to 32% trust, which is where we are today. I think it's a much more difficult question why this fall in interpersonal trust has occurred. I have some theories that I'd be happy to share with you. Uh, I've spoken long enough, though, I think. Uh, but uh, you know, I'd, say, you know, I'd, I'd say that, the, generally speaking, that the fall in institutional trust is much less mysterious than the fall in interpersonal trust. But if people can't trust each other, then that dramatically weakens their capacity for common action, acting with others in pursuit of shared goals. And so that has been a major casualty of the fall in interpersonal trust. And perhaps in the next round, I'll talk a little bit more about my somewhat controversial theories as to why this has happened. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think you've set us up beautifully because that was actually going to be my next question. 
why, why this follow an interpersonal trust. And as I was preparing for this uh, event, uh, I came across a line from Tocqueville um, where he says, In individuals, in individuals in democracies owe no man anything and hardly expect anything from anybody. Democracy's members do not care about one another and treat, treat, each, other's as uh, treat each other as strangers. Well, whether or not he's completely right about that or whether or not that has changed over time, which is clearly you're, you're saying it has, why the dribs and drabs decline in interpersonal trust? I mean, uh, Naomi, you talked a little bit about that um, in, in your own, uh, in, in the question of foster care. So I wonder if you would give us some ideas about why this might be, might be happening. And this could be to anyone. Um, I, I guess I would say, um, I think technology has something to do with it. Sorry, I take your answer. No, I was, wonder, I was wondering <laughs> if that was part of it. Yeah. No, I, I, I think so. I mean, I, I think that you know, there, there is a lot to be said for in-person communication, and I think that um, the amount of time that we are, are spending online and the amount of time that we are spending by ourselves online and the kind of weird personas we're portraying oh. online um, are, are, are alienating uh, people who might otherwise be people that, who, who would trust us. Um, and uh, even the sort of whole mechanism of online communication, I think, makes people uh, not trust each other. I mean, it's, it's, um, there's a very secretive element about it. There's a whole, you know, are you videotaping this? You know, are you going to tweet about this later? Are you going to, I mean, you know, this is a, that, that stuff is more recent. And obviously what, what Bill is talking about is a longer term uh, term problem, but in terms of what I've seen in you know looking at the last you know 10 to 15 years, I would say that these kind of technologies really undermine people's trust in each other. They never they never know um, you know who is who's watching them and who is and how whatever they say is going to come back to bite them later. Um, and I think that that really infuses our whole civic conversation with a, a kind of um, just just fear and anxiety. Um, I was recently at a museum in New York that just opened called Spyscape, um, which is a, it's like a, a, a espionage museum that offers you some history. But um, as you go around the museum, um, you're supposed to take these on these quizzes on the computer that uh, tell you whether you're personally suited to becoming a spy. <laughs> and and so some of the questions are very much like you know how much do you trust other people and um, you know does everyone have a secret motive and it's it's very interesting. I would love to sort of get their data. Not I have no idea whether people are answering these questions honestly, but it's interesting you know how much of um, what you know what they think is sort of required to be a spy is sort of the opposite of what's required to be a good citizen. So, so. low trust equals good spy. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, but but we you know. <laughs> Someone's watching. Anyway, I don't know if that answered your question. Spies, but I think spies rely for their work on people trusting. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I want to follow up. I'm so glad Bill broke things out for us and distinguished between trust in institutions and uh, trust in each other because although the panel is officially about trust in institutions, I think they have to have something to do with each other. The decline in trust in institutions, uh, especially more recently, the declines more recently must have something to do with the loss of trust uh, interpersonally. And let me just try out this thought. Uh, now, in some ways, the students I teach are not diverse. Uh, they, they all have 1540 SAT scores and were class valedictorians. They're all alike. Uh, but in many other ways, they're very diverse. And I noticed that. Everybody trusts some people, but lots of people don't trust a lot of other people. So I wouldn't break them down into trusters and non-trusters. The question is who do I trust and who don't I trust? Uh, now I'd imagine in some places that division would be along religious or ethnic or other such lines. Uh, we trust members of our tribe, but we certainly don't trust people outside the tribe. Uh, we trust people from around here, but we don't trust people who are strangers and so forth. There's a bit of that where I grew up in West Virginia. We don't, you know, we're not, we're not too trusting of strangers, but we sure trust the people around here. But I notice what in- What about the people from the next holler? That people from the next holler are also <laughs> in between. You know, <laughs> I can't quite trust them. 
Uh, <laughs> but I've noticed with, with my students, the divisions, so they're all remembered trusters of some and distrusters of others. The divisions are not along ethnic or even religious lines. They do tend to be along cultural lines so that more culturally, for want of a better word now, conservative mm -hmm. kids, whether they are observant Jews, evangelical Christians, faithful Catholics, more traditional Muslims, they trust each other. But they don't trust the good faith or motives of people on the more progressive side. And the more progressive students, whether they are Christian, Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, whatever they are, trust each other, but they don't trust the motives of people on the other side. Now, this is a visible and exaggerated form online. I think it's, it's exaggerated, but it's, it's, it's there. What, what, what's, what's happening is being exaggerated, but that fact that it's being exaggerated shouldn't lead us to miss that it is actually happening. People assume that people who are not on their side of those cultural divides are bad people. They're people of bad motives, not, not just incompetent. They may be that, too. Not just ignorant. They may be that, too. Maybe even stupid. Probably are stupid. People think people who disagree with them are stupid. But more fundamentally, they think they have bad motives. They're up to something bad. They want to do some bad thing. And both sides think that of the, of the other side. And you know, it's hard to run institutions for a society that includes everybody <laughs> across the spectrum and across those political uh, divides where you have that kind of interpersonal distrust. Now, I suppose you could say, well, gee, maybe it's a good thing, you know, given what we've seen throughout history, that, that people of different faiths and different ethnicities are allying together. Mm -hmm. But they're allying together against their own co-religionists who are on the opposite side of the cultural divide, who are themselves allied with people from other faiths or other ethnic groups um, on the other side. Well, you know, we are witnessing before our very eyes, religious schisms based on, right. you know, look what's happening to the United Methodists based on, exact, based on exactly that. Uh, and, you know, I would, you know, I would see you and raise you one. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, you know, what you said about culture is equally applicable to politics and partisanship. And the two are now very much related. Uh, I've often said that if there were to be a 50 years later remake of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, you know, it would be you know, a young woman from a pro progressive family in Bethesda, Maryland, bringing home as her fiance a Trump supporter, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> that, you know, and, and that if you look at surveys, Parents are much more willing to have their kids marry across religious lines, racial lines, ethnic lines, than they are to have them marry across cultural and political lines. And you know, I can see some, well, it has been a while you know, since All in the Family was made. I think it's about time for a remake, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> with some new oppositions, oppositions built in. So I would say that one of the drivers of increased interpersonal trust is these you know, intensifying cultural and political divisions. But let me, since you asked, you know, let me put three other ideas on the table for each of which there is support in social science. You know, first of all, you're prob most of you are probably familiar with this concept of social capital. Uh, you know, perhaps you've heard of Robert Putnam's famous article and then book, Bowling Alone, which refers to the number of sort of civil associations, starting with the family, but extending through religious organizations, voluntary organizations, of, uh, usually at the local and community level. Uh, and my hypothesis, for which there's reasonably good evidence, is that as these institutions have declined, interpersonal trust 
has declined along with them because these institutions are places where interpersonal trust is built. There's sort of a reciprocal relationship. You need a certain amount of trust to enter into them in the first place, but once you're there, based on the relationships you develop with other people, a certain amount of additional trust is created. Uh, you know, if you see, you know, if you join a church or a synagogue or a mosque uh, with certain hopes about the people in it and what they're going to be doing and what their values on are, and those hopes are then realized in your concrete experience, then your willingness to trust those people more broadly is going to be enhanced and, and, and strengthened. So that's po point number one. Point number two, and I, I say this, that this is the point that I always make to distress my fellow liberals. All other things being equal, increased diversity in a society means diminished interpersonal trust, at least for a generation until people get more accustomed to the increased diversity. So you would expect a period of high immigration, for example, to correspond with a, people, a period of declining interpersonal trust. And that's exactly what we've seen, not just in the United States. Third, and this is the point that I always make uh, to give you know, equal punishment to my conservative friends, there is a relationship between rising inequality and diminished interpersonal trust. When you have people living in ways that are radically unlike yours, uh, you tend not to trust them. If you're doing well, you're afraid that people who are not doing well are going to resent you. And you're afraid with justice that they will. If you're not doing well, you resent the people or tend to resent the people who are doing better. Uh, and you think, you know, we're not in all, we're not in this rising tide that lifts all boats. We're stuck at the bottom. Why are these other people floating while I'm drowning, right? So that's not a formula for interpersonal trust either. So we now have four ideas on the table <laughs> as, to, you know, as to the sources of declining interpersonal trust. I personally think there's something to all four of them. So let me ask you about number one and number three in, yeah. the, in the three that you just put on the table. Uh, on institutions, yeah. um, bowling leagues, yeah. uh, Shriners, Knights of Columbus, Boy mm, Scouts, exactly, uh, yeah. religious organizations, and so forth. Um, Yuval Levin, in his wonderful uh, new book, just I think just published yesterday, uh, I heard it given as a set of lectures at Princeton a couple of years ago, um, makes the point that institutions at their best, and historically our institutions of civil society, have been formative yeah. and not simply platforms. Right. They've become more like platforms and less formative. So it's not only that when you're in the institution, you're bowling with these guys or doing, you know, doing good, good work with the St. Vincent de Paul Society people or whatever it is. You're not only learning to trust them, you're being shaped by the institution mm -hmm. itself and mm -hmm. you're being shaped in a similar direction. Now, of course, that's bad if it's a bad institution shaping you in a bad way, but it's very good if it's a good institution shaping you in a, in a, in a good way. So I'm sort of wondering about your thoughts on that. Well, I think, yeah, go ahead. You know, I, I, you know, I think uh, I've read Yuval's book, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, I, certainly, I certainly agree with the basic point that he's making, as he, you know, you know as he, as he says, he practices what I would call hand-me-down Aristotelianism. <laughs> and since I'm sort of a hand-me-down Aristotelian myself, I'm very sympathetic <laughs> to this line of argument. Uh, and le let me put it you know, in the language of, of this panel. You know, in these institutions, if they're functioning well, you become more trustworthy. Yes, of course. And so you know, what you really want is an institution in a, or a society in which there is a lot of trust and that trust is warranted, right? If you're in a society with a lot of trust but it's not warranted, then you, know, you have a society divided into the takers and the suckers. You don't want that. On the other hand, if you have a society with a lot of mistrust, 
But the people in positions of authority are actually good people trying to do their best and competent, competent to do well. Then you have a sort of a surplus paranoia, a surplus of mistrust, and you don't want that either. You want, you know, you want a good relationship between the inner sentiment of trust on the one hand and the outer fact of trustworthiness on the other. And formative institutions, when they're working well, help to create that symmetry or parity between trust and trustworthiness. Yeah. It's, Part it of how the, be, uh, uh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I mean, uh, what you and Robbie seem to be talking about is, is really just, I, I mean, how much politics is really interfering with the development of these relationships, I mean, with, with your students. I mean, the, the, the thing about bowling leagues is you don't have to talk about politics. I mean, you know, you can have people, you know, from all different backgrounds sure. who are, you know, maybe not all different backgrounds, but from different political uh, viewpoints who are bowling together. And, you know, the, the decline of those institutions is not just that we're not together as much, but we're not together as much in ways that don't involve talking about politics. And, and, and particularly that don't involve talking about national politics or kind of hot button political issues. I mean, you could get together with your bowling league and discuss who was running for the school committee or the city council, um, but you didn't necessarily have to have it out over abortion. Or Trump. Yeah. Or, or Donald Trump, no. And, and I think that that, you know, the, the, the vehicle, the venue for that to happen um, is, is increasingly rare. And I, um, and I think, you know, the, the, the marriage stuff, when you were talking about the, I, I spent, uh, I wrote a book about interfaith marriage, so I spent some time exploring this question of why we're so much more willing to marry outside of our faith now than outside of our um, kind of political tradition. And I think one, one reason for that is that we actually know much less about um, other people's faith traditions and know much more about their political viewpoints. If you go out on a date with someone, I mean, chances are within, by the end of the evening, you're gonna find out whether they watch Fox News or MSNBC or you know, what they think about Donald Trump or all of these things. Whereas I would, I would, I would venture to guess, and I've talked to people older than me, um, that, that this was not a first date topic necessarily so. you know, 50 years ago. Um, and that there were other things, and you weren't supposed to talk about politics right away. Um, and so now, you know, that is kind of the front and center conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you could tell by the end of the night whether you ever want to see this person again because you find yourself on opposite sides of the political spectrum, which is, I think, what you're seeing, you know, with your yeah. with your students. Um, so we we just don't have those places to have um, non-political conversation, and the and the um, and the conversation breaks down much faster as a result. I think. Let, let me jump in here yeah. um, just to steer us a, uh, sorry, a little bit back. I, I'm sure we could go on uh, for yes. the entire time just talking uh, along these lines, but I, I want to um, bring us back in one other sense. I, the, I do want to postulate one final reason, and I would be interested to know what you all think about this, that part of the reason it's difficult to have social trust is that we don't live with people very long. We, are, we tend to move from city to city, at least within a certain uh, stratum of the uh, achieving class. It's, it's not the case that the bowling leagues have been there forever because the people that populate the bowling leagues haven't, haven't been living in that city. So it seems to me there's a certain part of the, the, the meritocracy that will be hesitant to, uh, to, to trust simply because you're in competition for the same goods. And I'd love to hear your th thoughts on that, but as I put that out there also, I wanna ask, do you see any ways of going forward and trying to remedy this problem of social trust? How do we, re how do we rebuild the trust that, that we've lost? Well, um, my mother, uh, who is uh, 87, has lived her entire life within 300 yards of where she was born. By contrast, my wife and I, just one generation later, once moved seven times in six years. So that's a big, that's a big, that's a big shift. And that's got to make some sort of difference, although if you have functioning institutions, your particular faith tradition, institutions like the Boy Scouts, it at least used to be the case that you found a home wherever you moved to. You know, you might have been in Scouts in Tuscaloosa and now you're uh, up in Bangor, but you put your kids in the Scout, in the Scout troops. You're a member of the United Methodist Church uh, in uh, Tempe, and you move to uh, Ann Arbor, you join the United Methodist Church in, 
Ann Arbor. Today, I don't think people will necessarily uh, do that. For, for example, you want to know whether the United Methodist Church in Ann Arbor is anything remotely like the Methodist Church in, in Tempe. You may belong in a different sort of institution. You're certainly not just going to trust that that church is going to be like your church when it comes to your, uh, to your values. Uh, second point I wanted to make is um, part of the I think we can show the importance of trust for the health and healthy functioning of institutions by looking at a bad institution and looking how at how trust enabled a bad institution to flourish and how we were able to undermine a bad institution by undermining trust. And I'm talking about the mafia. The success of the mafia relied on trust, for example, in the Code of Amerita. Uh, the, the mafia flourished where Mafia people trusted each other and knew that other mafia people wouldn't rat them, rat them out. If you talk to prosecutors in the, who, who were at work in places like New York during the period when the mob was finally broken, they'll tell you how they did it. They broke the trust. You, you, you got somebody to breach the code. And suddenly nobody can trust anybody else. And now prosecutors can start to dismantle the, uh, the institution. Well, we should learn from that. Uh, we can't afford, We're, our institution is not going to flourish if we don't re, rebuild trust. Uh, and can I just go back to that third point of bills that I, I, want, I wanted to raise, and that's the one about economic uh, differences and the tendency of people uh, to distrust people at the opposite end of the spectrum, the wealthy, uh, distrusting uh, people who are less well off, fearing that they'll resent them, try to uh, take from them. And then the opposite, you know, people in the lower echelons resenting people in the upper echelons of the economic system thinking that they must have cheated or whatever to get ahead. I wonder, Bill, if they're the key historically, and I think we need to get this back if, if I'm right that it is the key historically, is that you can maintain trust even in the face of pretty dramatic inequality where people think they can rise, where there's genuine social mobility so that People may be on the bottom today, they may be recent immigrants, they may have come with nothing, as so many of our own grandparents and great-grandparents did, but they believe that the system is not rigged against them and they can rise. We, we've had a pretty lengthy period now when social mobility has been very much diminished, and I think that probably has more to do, I'm just speculating, but I'd be curious to see if you agree, more to do with the, the lack of trust between the classes than just that one's rich, one's poor. Uh, I mostly agree with what you just said, but with a distinction or an addition. And that is, I don't think it's any accident that we were a very high trust society, both interpersonally and institutionally, at a time when people were actually rising together. Mm -hmm. right? It wasn't just they believed they could, they felt that they were, and they were right, right? And so in the 20 years after the Second World War, everybody got ahead considerably. And the growth at the bottom, the growth in the middle, and the growth in the top were all about equal. And so yes, there were gaps between the rich, the middle class, and the poor, but the rich were getting richer, the middle class were, was getting richer, the poor were getting richer, and people didn't think that they were fighting over a static pie, mm -hmm. right? And if you have a situation, and there are two situations that are the death for that. First of all, when the pie actually is static, right, and you really are fighting over shares of, of a total that isn't increasing, or when there's growth, but the fruits of that growth accrue unequally. Uh, to the very top, which I'll put on my liberal hat for just a, just a minute, is the situation that we've experienced over the past generation or so. And you don't have to be a Marxist to believe that changes in the structure of the economy have tended to inure to the advantage of the people who are already at the top during this period. And people in the middle class and the working class have made out, made out less, less well. Uh, but now let me segue just for a minute from social mobility to geographical mobility. I would believe the story about geographical mobility and the decline of interpersonal trust were it not for an inconvenient fact 
and that is that geographical mobility has declined steadily over the past half century. We are a much less geographically mobile society than we were when I was a young man 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, so I think we're, we're going to have to come up with another explanation, because that one won't wash. I, I was actually thinking. I'm surprised just by the fact. I, I oh, well, you yeah. know, no, facts, no, are, facts are stubborn right. things, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't don't bother me with the facts. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, no, this is this is. I was thinking that this is this is definitely true that we we move around much less than we used to. Um, we move around geographically much less than we used to, but I also think, um, and this is sort of a cause and effect of our um, of, of institutional affiliations that you were talking about. Like when you you know when you move someplace, you automatically join the. But even when you were already there, I don't think the automatically join the. Is 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 in our minds the same way? I mean, now I mean, w w there was a there was a book a number of years ago called Shopping for God. I mean, and and it and it described how even with regard to churches, everybody wants to shop around, no matter what the institution is yeah. that you're picking, whether you're picking a school or a church, um, or you know, a, even if you're going to pick a bowling league, you will want to sort of check out all of these things, and you're always going to be sort of looking over your shoulder and wondering whether you picked the right thing and whether somebody else kind of has it better. And I think, you know, just the, the lack of kind of, uh, you know, kind of automatically joining the thing that maybe your parents were part of or maybe um, sticking with the thing that you've been part of for a long time. Like I said, it's a cause and effect, um, but always trying to be on the lookout for what are the other possibilities out there gives people this feeling of instability. Like, well, if you're going to go join the other bowling league, maybe this bowling league won't be there next year, and then what am I going to do? And I think, you know, people have that sense with churches a lot. I mean, you know, there's a, there are, you have a small church that you've started, and everybody's excited about it, and they're, uh, you know, a, a inter, you're an integral part of it, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the church makes one decision you don't like, and you say, you know, I've had enough. I'm going to the church down the street. This is a, usually a joke about Jewish people, but not. Yeah. Um, you know, the, but um, there has but to be a third. The, show, I, yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> right. The, there's a, the the famous joke about the the um, the Jew who's uh, I'm, I'm Jewish. I can make Jewish jokes. Um, uh, stranded I'm on. I'm Jewish, so I can laugh at them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're doing here. They're stranded on a desert Jewish island. Primarily. Yes, stranded on a desert island, and somebody comes to rescue him, and he they he sees sort of two different buildings that he's erected, and he says, "What's that? Oh, that's my synagogue. What's that? That's the synagogue I would never attend." Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, but I, I do think the sort of the paradox of choice um, has extended to institutions too, and that has eroded social trust. Well, I can't pretend to be a religious historian, but what little I do know about religious history suggests to me that American religion has always been, you know, more innovative and more competitive than religious practice in most other countries, uh, and so. You know, um, Americans are famous for coming up with new denominations, you know, for splits and schisms. Uh, there are, there are no longer, except, you know, except among traditional Catholics, parishes to which you are assigned by geography. I mean, the principle of congregationalism, of choice, and of mobility among congregations is I think one of the great constants of American religious history, which reflects, you know, our broader history uh, as, you know, as a kind of Protestant culture. <laughs> I mean, Ju Judaism has become more Protestant. Catholicism has. And Catholicism certainly has under the influence of the political and social culture of America. Mm -hmm. and so so along those lines then, can churches help in the rebuilding of social trust or are they just part of the problem? Well, they've got to get their own houses in order. Mm. Uh, and that's very complicated business. There are many facets to that uh, problem. Uh, one is the one I mentioned at the beginning, uh, just dealing with the reality of, uh, I guess I can use this term in the context of churches, sin within the church. Uh, bad behavior, immoral behavior, whether it's of a sexual nature, financial uh, nature, uh, the kinds of things that, uh, the kinds of behavior that has brought religious institutions into disrepute and, and eroded trust. But then there's the more difficult one in a way, and that is 
churches figuring out what they really do stand for and sorting themselves out. There's a certain sorting that's going on along those cultural lines that Bill and I were talking about. Bill mentioned that you're seeing it right in front of our noses today uh, in the United Methodist Church. But you know, we've seen it in the other churches, the, um, the Anglican uh, churches. It's happening you know, within the Catholic Church to some, to some extent, the different Jewish uh, denominations uh, from Reform to Orthodox to ultra-Orthodox. Um, people don't trust people that they fundamentally disagree with within their tradition of faith. And it's hard to straddle that. Now, some churches have tried. Some, some have been trying for quite a number of years, but I don't think they'll succeed. I think at the end, there will have to be a sorting out, the sort of thing as regrettable as I myself find it to be as a sympathetic friend of the Methodist world. Uh, as, as, as much as I wish it weren't the case, I think it's inevitable that there will have to be a, a, a sorting out so that the so that people who actually do share fundamental beliefs are together and we don't have a war going on within the tradition because people, despite being formally affiliated with this or that particular tradition, have fundamental religious and moral disagreements with people that are supposed to be their co-religionists. Again, I find that extremely regrettable, but I think it's true. I think um, one thing I've seen is uh, certainly among younger generation, a desire actually almost to return to like a, a sort of parish model, which is that um, some of them seem to prefer churches that have a clear geographical um, boundary, that, that their people, you know, they're not, they don't want to necessarily drive 40 minutes to the mega church because it has better coffee or something like that than, than the church that's closer to them. They would rather kind of go to the church that's closer to them. And, and the advantage to that too is that then those are people that they actually run into in more than one context in your life, which I think also contributes to the social trust element too. So that same person that you're with in church on Sunday, you know, you know more about that person. They might be working with you. You might see them at a, you know, at a coffee shop or something like that. And that gives you uh, kind of a, a better sense of who they are and maybe more of a sense that you can, you can trust them too. By the way, I think it's interesting to watch. I mean, I, I, would, I would encourage uh, uh, people, including maybe even especially non-Muslims, to watch what's happening in the American Muslim uh, community today. The same sorts of struggles that have gone on in uh, the Protestant world and now uh, to a considerable degree in the Catholic world, we're seeing within American Islam. There's an Islamic progressive uh, movement and then there are more uh, traditional people currently occupying the same mosque and identifying with the same community, but already getting into some pretty fierce conflicts with each other about these, uh, about these fundamental cultural and moral issues. Well, just a, a, a couple of comments. First of all, as I read the history of the Catholic Church in modern times, the Americanization of the Catholic Church in America had extraordinarily fruitful spillover effects because it helped lead to a renewal of the global Catholic Church you know, through the intervention of figures such as John Courtney Murray and others. Uh, I know that there may be a diversity of views yes, about exactly. Vatican II on this panel, but uh, <laughs> you know, I just, as you know, you know I, uh, and it's easy for me to say as a non-Catholic, uh, but uh, you know, I, I, I think that you know, there was some necessary doctrinal rethinking that occurred as the result of the American Catholic influence on the global, on the global Catholic Bill, Church. Bill, as a result might be too strong, but uh, I would certainly agree that American uh, Catholicism, especially as represented by somebody like John Courtney Murray, had a major impact, uh, from my own point of view, positive impact on developments at the, at the Second Vatican Council yes, and therefore yes. the development of the teaching and uh, practice of the, of the Catholic Church. I rather suspect there would not be much disagreement on this panel about Vatican II. But Glad within yeah. the contemporary Catholic Church and within contemporary Catholic intellectual life, there is a fierce uh, disagreement about, about Vatican II and it's kind of playing out right in in front of us now, one that had been to some considerable extent actually under the surface mm -hmm. until this pontificate, the pontificate of, of, uh, of Francis. 
But here, the Catholic Church, as I've uh, hinted several times, is, is just going through what so many other institutions, religious institutions, uh, Protestant religious institutions, and Jewish institutions have gone through themselves. Yeah, it, what it shows is the Catholic Church, even though having a central headquarters and a central teaching authority and all the stuff that we Catholics used to think would insulate us from the sort of uh, division that you have in uh, Jewish and, and Protestant uh, traditions, turns out we were wrong about that. We're not, at least not completely insulated from it. Uh, here's, here's just the, the, the second point I wanted to make about your question, which actually builds on something that Naomi said a couple of minutes ago, and that is having to do with the advantages of what I will call a quasi-parish organization. And here I can speak from personal experience. Uh, as you can see by observing me, I am not an Orthodox Jew. My son is a very Orthodox Jew. You know, you know there's, a, yeah, there's a brand of Orthodoxy called modern Orthodoxy. I would describe his as pre-modern Orthodoxy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, which is, you know, and I don't mean that to denigrate it. It's a very impressive tradition, you know, which has rigors and rewards all of its own. But one of, the, one, of the feature, one of the doctrinal features which influences daily life is that on Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath, you do not drive. Now, if you combine the prohibition on driving with the commandment to attend religious services, You've got to live here. there's only one conclusion, that you know, one livable conclusion, you have to live within walking difference of distance of the synagogue. And what that means, you know, as Naomi said, was that the, the people that you see there are the same people that you see in your community, you see in the stores, you know, you see on various social occasions, et cetera. And it generates, on the one hand, a kind of intensity of community uh, that does build trust within the community. I can't say that it does much for building bonds of trust beyond the community, however, and that is a problem. You know, what if the consequence of stronger communities is diminished intercommunal bonds? Can we count on the fact that there's more trust inside trust-building institutions to spill over? This is a question that Robert Putnam asks you know, in his famous distinction between bonding capital as opposed to bridging capital. We have a lot of bonding going on, but not a whole lot of bridging, and I think we need more bridges in contemporary America, but nobody's building them. Well, that, that's certainly uh, something raised by, I'm sure most people here are familiar with the Benedict Option and uh, the, the notion that we ought to sort of retreat to these communities where we can have strong bonds of social trust, but you're right, that doesn't address. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is one of Alastair McIntyre's most pernicious legacies, in my view, <laughs> <laughs> the Benedictine option. But let me not start. No, I just did start that fight, but now let me end, <laughs> let me end it before it gets out of control. <laughs> well, I think now would be a good time to open up the panel to questions. I do have the question still standing out there that nobody has really yet taken up of remedies, uh -huh. although we've kind of talked around it. So if you feel like uh, addressing that uh, in your remarks, please do. But for now, we'd like to open this up to the audience and uh, get some questions from you all. We'll start over there. Thank you for a fascinating discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about Reagan's paraphrase of the Russian maxim, uh, trust but verify, and wondering whether in addition to the, uh, you know, to the environmental conditions that you've mentioned, uh, whether it's rise in technology, mobility, et cetera. It's this sense that we can verify things more easily now, perhaps as, a, mm -hmm. as an aspect of technology, and that's what was happening during the 60s. It wasn't just the Vietnam War, it wasn't just uh, the uh, uh, Watergate, but this sense that uh, the Vietnam War was a living room war. We could see it in our living room, we could see things in real time, and now with uh, children with cell phones, uh, the ability to check on things and uh, advocate for transparency in real time, we want to verify everything. Does that have an impact on trust? Well, imagine a marriage 
where you think you have to verify everything, right? I mean, that's not a marriage that's long for this world, right? I mean, trust at some point means that you don't feel that you have to verify all the time. And so trust but verify is a way station on the conclusion don't trust. Uh, I guess I would, I would argue with the premise that the ability to Google you know, equals the ability to verify, you know. Uh, so let's, you know, I mean, I could talk about, I could talk about misdeeds in my own faith, but since Catholicism has been so much more in the news, I don't mean to beat up on the Catholic Church, but just to use it, just to use it as a reference point, all the Googling in the world didn't save the members of that church, you know, in some cases from being abused, and in most other cases from not knowing that the abuse was going on. There were some cases where it was known and simply you know, not spoken of or even covered up, depending on your situation, situation in the church. And so, and so the idea that we've achieved anything like institutional transparency is, I think, not true to the fact, facts despite the spread of technology. Now, it is perfectly true if you're going out on a first date, you can find out a lot more about your first date, so I'm told. Uh, <laughs> as someone who's been married for 51 years, I've really oh, had to add that. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, you know, but you can find out a lot more about your first date, uh, but an astonishing number of first dates don't lead to second dates, which means there's a lot you didn't find out on, on Google or social media. You, you know, um, if I understand the history correctly, there was a time when the media in general uh, left some things behind the curtain. Right. John F. Kennedy's philandering, uh, for example. Uh, perhaps even, you know, just to stick with the Kennedy administration, the, uh, the uh, collaboration with the mob in an effort to uh, perhaps assassinate Castro, things like that, those were not revealed to the public. Now, maybe had those things been revealed, we would have gotten the collapse of trust much earlier. And I'm certainly not one who's going to tell you we should go back to those, quote, good old days when the, when the media protected politicians by not exposing uh, those kinds of things. But I'm still inclined to agree with, uh, with Bill that, that the um, demand for verification is much more likely to be the result of the collapse in trust than it is to be a substantial cause in the, in the collapse of trust. It seems to me that, anyway. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Zelman. I'm the faith-based director for the U.S. Department of Labor. So obviously I'm gonna ask a question that's uh, related to uh, labor and workforce participation. Before I say that, Dr. Corey, go Tigers. <laughs> at LSU here. Um, uh, I'm going to give two quick anecdotes and then it's going to lead right into the question. I have two sons. Uh, my wife and I are blessed to have two sons and five, three daughters. My oldest son is in an elite uh, college in New York. Only person in his dorm in his freshman year of 24 people that had a wage hour job when he was in high school. And I just mean working at a bed and breakfast, washing dishes and busting tables. Nothing fancy, but the only one on his floor. Uh, our younger son actually works at McDonald's. It's a couple blocks from our house. Um, and a lot of my colleagues, as you can tell, I'm somewhat on the white collar side, are shocked that our son would work at McDonald's. The reason why I bring both of those up is I want to get a sense, all the data shows from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so this part's not in dispute, I don't think, that there are lower workforce participation rates for teenagers. It peaked about 35 or 40 years ago, and it's steadily uh, slowly but steadily declined to this day. And I kind of wanted to get a sense from the group. Uh, I know there's a lot of reasons as to why social capital is declining, family, these other things. But I wanted to get a sense from the group what you thought about workforce participation rates and, 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 and efforts to remove barriers or at least lessen them so that younger people can enter the workforce and the importance of being in the workforce, being around people that are different and the capital that can be taken. Um, so 
Let's see. I, I, I have a, a, a daughter who is about a year younger than I was when I had my first, uh, what do you call it, wage hour job. Um, uh, and it is hard for me to imagine having her spend her summer do that now, doing that now. I don't, I'm not sure why. I think it's the sort of community that I live in um, and, uh, and the expectations for you know, elite families uh, about what, what their kids are gonna do to prepare themselves for college, mostly. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think I should go ahead and, and have her, you know, do one of those jobs because they, they learned, I learned very valuable lessons about, right, people who are not like me. Um, but also, uh, you know, I think the, the, the social trust starts on a very, um, you know, basic level. I mean, your basic interactions with people when you're in a kind of customer service job for, you know, how you have conversations and what you learn about them and, you know, and, and how to act toward other people that you don't know to, to build a level of trust. And, you know, you have the regular customers and, you know, people who come in all the time. And, and those are, you know, that's not, I think, mostly what we're talking about when we're talking about social trust. But I think it does sort of help people build a, a foundation for that. So, um, you know, on the one hand, you have the, uh, I think, you know, uh, wealthier, more educated families opting out. Um, and then you also have, on the lower end of the spectrum, a lot of, you know, young men. This is the sort of men without work, um, uh, you know, who are, who are opting out as well. You know, able-bodied, something like, what is it, 40 million able-bodied men in the United States between 18 and 30 or something decide that they're just not going to work at all. Um, 18 and 40, I'm sorry. Um, say that again? 4 million? I thought you said 40 million. It's more than that, though. I think it's Is that an hour to work? Yes. No, it's four and a four, half four and a half million. Four and a half million. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the lack of workforce participation is definitely having an effect, um, effect on social trust at both ends of the, of the economic spectrum. Let me say a couple of things in response to that excellent question. Uh, one, uh, I think it's very important for young men and women to learn a sense of responsibility. And having a wage and hour job at a relatively early age, not too young, I'm not for going back to child labor. <laughs> there, there you go. I, I think that's a good thing, a sense of responsibility, learning the value of a dollar, that money doesn't grow on trees, and avoiding a sense of entitlement. This is a big problem for kids at the upper end. A, a lot of the kids that I teach, they're great kids, they're wonderful, I love them, but there's a little bit of a sense of entitlement there because things have always been given to them. I mean, their, their, their big objective has been to figure out which charity they can found in high school so they can put that on their college uh, application. Well, wage and hour job might be better than founding a charity to put on your college application. So I, I think those are valuable things. I also think it's very important, and, and work sometimes provides this, for people to mix on terms of at least rough equality with people who are unlike them people of different religious faiths, people of different social classes, people with different beliefs, people with different cultural backgrounds and so forth. And to some extent, we're, we're siloed today. And, and kids grow up not knowing people who are unlike their own uh, families. I, uh, thinking back on my own experience, I think it was a big advantage for me growing up in West Virginia, grandparents coal miners, but in the town where the state university was. The faculty at State University and a lot of the staff at the State University were very, very different from the people that I mixed with who were my father's friends, uh, who we got together with at the Rod and Gun Club, um, or I played bluegrass music, people I played bluegrass music with. Uh, they, were, they were coal miners and, and pipe fitters and uh, women worked at home or, or, or had uh, jobs that made them, it caused them to be on their feet all day, you know, it wasn't easy work. Their values were different, their beliefs were different. People at the university had more progressive sorts of ideas, more liberal, they were, um, they, they were better off financially in a great many, in many cases. I look back on that and I'm really glad for it. I, I think just it's, it, the point of that whole exercise wasn't to benefit me, but it did have a big benefit on me and I suppose other people who were growing up like that. And I think that in a lot of parts of our country today, this really is lost. Most people only know people who are very much like them. I would have thought, but it turns out that I would have been wrong to think, that that problem is solved by just the availability of media 
that you get to know people virtually doesn't actually work yeah. that way. You can't do this by watching people who are different on TV or even engaging with them on Facebook or in other, in other social media. You need to have opportunities to, to be together. Yeah, Bill. Let me just drop a very quick historical footnote. Robbie just said word for word what I would have said. I will add only, and I speak from personal experience, there was a time when we had a society-wide institution like that. It was called the draft. Yeah. Uh, and I was, I was drafted during the Vietnam War period, and I served for a couple of years. Uh, I was drafted out of graduate school. It was not the way I would have chosen to spend those two years, uh, but I think I'm better for it, and for precisely the reason. You're mixing you, with people who yep, are different Exactly, yeah. and, you know, and the fact that we no longer have an institutional, institutionalized society-wide mechanism bringing people together across all these lines of differences means we have to think even harder about other forms of social life or life in the private sector that might have some of those same effects. And, uh, and what, you're talk what you're talking about is, is, is one of them for sure. Uh, but if you look at the scale of values encoded in the application process to elite universities, I suspect very strongly that a summer at McDonald's will not be rewarded nearly as high, highly as the summer in, you know, in Ecuador, right? And, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, as in the case with every, every society has a societal hierarchy which is based on values, choices, and then encoded in its institutions. And I think the way our elite institutions select for some kinds of activities and some sorts of people who are disproportionately likely to engage in those activities as opposed to others speaks volumes about what we really care about as opposed to what we profess to care about. Bill, I was making exactly the argument you were making uh, to a student the other day. And? And she asked me, well then, Professor George, do you agree it would be a great idea to institute national service? It doesn't have to be a military draft, national service. There are lots of things we could do in infrastructure, care for the poor, and it would, it would function the way the draft functioned. And you said? And I said, no, I'm not in favor of national service because I don't trust the government to run it. There you go. <laughs> they, would, they would do social engineering social and try to indoctrinate right people. Yeah, so I, there's, there's the problem. <laughs> well, and that illustrates a deeper problem, and that is that absent a certain level of trust, getting back to your question, you cannot rebuild the institutions which in turn yeah. build trust, right? A perfect example of this downward spiral that we're locked into. Right, so. <laughs> that, that lady's got a question and she's very eager to ask it. Can we get her a microphone? There, there we go. I'm just wondering if what you think about the level of um, individualism in our society, the balance between that in the value of individualism and community. I feel like we've shifted really far from community to very individualistic and very kind of self-serving um, goals. And this, do you think that lack of trust uh, might rise from this? Or, I, I mean, I don't know, just wondering what you thought about this. Because I, I, I feel like working towards a greater good um, gets you away from yourself and with a focus on others. And I think this is good for us, it's healthy for us, but I don't necessarily see it as much of a value anymore. Thank you. Where to begin? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I wish, I wish I could tell you I and mean, some people like to write cultural history this way, I'm not one of them, you know, that America as a nation has declined from communalism into individualism. But as the little quote from Tocqueville that we heard some time ago illustrates, nothing could be farther from the truth. And Tocqueville worried in volume two of Democracy in America, uh, Democracy in America you know, that our individualism might lead to some real social pathologies. So that was, you know, 
That was in that was in one of the heydays of you know America. I mean, Tocqueville famously celebrated America as the joiner society. Right, we were getting together, but he was always careful to note the strong element of individualism and choice that undergirded you know, what we chose to join and whether we chose to remain, et cetera. Individualism is part of our cultural DNA. It is one of the things that distinguishes us from other Western countries. That's been true from the beginning, and it remains true now. The question then is what happens when individualism turns into hyper-individualism, as it has from time to time in American history. Uh, and then we need to be brought back, but, you know, and there are two different ways of bringing it back. One is through war, right? I mean, war tends to mute individualism. It, you know, and it brings about a more collectivist spirit. I used that term deliberately to illustrate the double-edged the, the double sword nature of the collectivist spirit. Uh, and this has led many people, starting with William James famously, to search for a moral equivalent of war in peacetime. Fortunately for American democracy, there is no such equivalent. Uh, and you know, so the other way that this happens you know, is through the various sorts of renewal movements that have studied, studied American history from time to time, the so-called Great Awakenings. Now, all of those have been religious. Is it possible in current times to have a more cultural version of a Great Awakening that mobilizes people back into collective activities at the, communi at the community and local level? I don't know, but that's what you're talking about, a rebalancing within a fundamentally individualist society. You ask a professor a question, you get a book assignment, uh, but not my own book. Uh, I would assign Bill's uh, book, which is relevant to this. It's, a, it's an old book that was a big influence on me, Bill, years ago, Liberal Purposes. Um, I hope you haven't repudiated. I, I, I like that book. No. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's been a long time since anybody's tried to boost the paperback sales. <laughs> well, I just did my part. I can't contain my gratitude. <laughs> the other book that I'd recommend, uh, although it, I think it may press the point a little further than what's warranted, but he's trying to correct uh, something that I think needed corrected, is Barry Shane's book, S-H-A-I-N, The Myth of American Individualism. I think I have the title right, you something do. like that, The Myth of American uh, Individualism. And there is this myth, and it is a myth, of the rugged individualism of the American, that we only kind of you know, care about ourselves and so forth. I think Bill's right that it's a question of getting the balance right. We need to avoid hyper-individualism. We don't want to adopt the collectivist spirit either. I mean, that's, that's the road to perdition. We need to value the person. That, that, that's, what, that, that, that's really, at the end of the day, what matters, the person. But we have to understand that the person is not what, uh, I'll borrow a term from my friend, our friend, Michael Sandel, an unencumbered self. Uh, it's not the lonely individual. The person comes into the very world, in his very coming to be, comes into the world in relationships. He's got a mom. She was right there when he was born. You know, with any luck, there's a dad somewhere uh, nearby. There are grandparents, and maybe brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. They're often born into a religious uh, tradition, which makes claims. The child may be baptized. The male infant uh, Jewish child maybe probably will be circumcised. So things start happening, you know, right off the bat. We're not just unencumbered selves, tabula rasa. Um, uh, so the person is a person in relationship, not this the, the, the naked individual. The person is what it's all about. The person is what law is for. The person is what institutions are for. But again, not the naked individual, the person in relationship. The fulfillment of us as individuals, as persons, includes fulfillment in respect of inherently social sorts of things. Friendships, marriages, membership in every sort of voluntary uh, association, religious ones, and other, uh, other sorts of things. So I think that's what we have to bear in mind. I think sometimes when people talk about our problem with hyper-individualism, and I, I agree it's a serious problem today, uh, it is used as a term that 
that we need to get behind because there's some other things going on that are driving it. And I think they have to do basically with values, with the values that we hold, the values that we transmit to our children. I do a lot of work with my friend and co-teacher Cornell West on this. We go around the country or in our classes at, at, at Princeton, and we try to raise for students, young people, the question, what's life about? What's worth living for? What, what, what's it all about? What are the goals? What makes a life a good life? And of course, what we're transmitting to our kids in so many ways, as parents, even as teachers, certainly the media, so many cultural institutions, is what makes life important and valuable is wealth, power, influence, status, prestige, none of which are bad things, and all of which I think it's okay for us to encourage our children to aspire to, to have social standing, to, to make a good living. Those aren't, those aren't bad, but they're not ultimate. They're not what really matters. Those are means. They're not ends in themselves. And we go very wrong. And I think this is part of our hyper-individualism, what's driving it, when we think of those as ends in themselves, as the things that really matter, as opposed to things that are good if you do good things with them, but they're not what's ultimate. You know? They're not friendship, knowledge, the appreciation of beautiful form or beautiful things. They're not the intrinsic goods, the fundamental purposes that make human life really something special and worth living. End of sermon. I suspect we could go on for quite a bit longer, but let's thank was our that, panel. Was that the Brexit celebration? <laughs> <laughs>